Good evening, mga kabitanan. Today we are celebrating also the uh, as part of the observance of the CN month. For this particular Sunday, we are celebrating the ministry and the presence of the women. The women, really. <laughs> the CWA represented by the uh, CWA. And last Sunday, we also celebrated the ministry of God uh, expressed through the uh, group of the young people. And so we praise the Lord. We thank God for the That was relayed to her over the phone. Or she thought that was she got the information right. Actually, she got lost. And she stopped at a gas station and she asked for help. She knew that the race started in the parking lot of a shopping mall. The station attendant also knew of such race scheduled just up the road and directed this female runner there. When she arrived, she was relieved to see in the parking lot a modest number of runners preparing to compete. Not as many as she had expected, and there were no other personalities with her caliber. Then she thought to herself, this race will be easy. And so, she hurried to the registration desk, and the, the one in charge guided her as to what to do. And the organizer proudly announced that in this race, a renowned uh, runner has joined them. They're so happy to see this uh, lady joining the event. And so, when they look up the registration, they had no entry of her name. But the one in charge uh, told her that she can put a number and she can join in the race. So that she could make it before the, the gun goes off. Of course, that was her intention to join the race. So she ran and naturally, of course, she's the renowned uh, athlete. Of course, she won. She won some four minutes ahead of the first male runner in the second place. Actually, only after the race, when there was no envelope containing her sizable prize and performance money, it was actually a fun run. <laughs> There's no prize money. Did she confirm that the event she'd run was not the race to which she had been invited? The race actually started long ago, since um, just before he arrived in this, uh, in this contest. It was held in another place, but she got lost. So she missed um, getting the prize of the contest because she was in the wrong race. This story sometimes speak of our involvement not only in church but even in the activities of life. There are times that we need to ask ourselves whether we are joining the right race. Every time someone or some group or sometime an organization would invite you to join, the usual expectation is to ask ourselves what's in it for me. This question has something to do with the benefits you get if you put your time and you allow yourself to participate in any endeavors, including the activities in church. Sometimes, on Sundays, it is not usually our instinct or natural 
uh, habit that every Sunday we dress up and we prepare to go to church. There are instances in our spiritual journey that we struggle whether we go to church or not. Even though as Christians, we know we should be in church every Sunday. I think it has something to do not with our laziness or however you call that. But sometimes it has something to do with our expectation that in everything that you put your heart into it, there must be a, a form of reward. That you will get something out from it. That you will benefit out from it. And that is why, to be frank about us, about our spiritual experience, is that people would stop coming to church because they feel they get nothing out of it. You know? That's the, what shall I say, the explanation why they stop going to church. I get nothing out from the worship. You know? Well, what are you supposed to get out from your worship experience? What's in it for us? And to be precise and specific about it, what's in it for us if we come to church to worship? What is there waiting for us? Is it about asking God to do something in your behalf? Is it maybe because you want to, uh, you'll go to church because you want to be informed about the biblical truths and you want to know more? So the question is, what's in it for you? Our story, actually, is somewhat addressing this issue in a different manner. Our text is, we found Jesus after, actually the chapter 9 incident is after the transfiguration of Jesus. And where the three closest friends of Jesus witnessed, the, witnessed Jesus Christ transfigured. He was changed. And they were going to uh, another place. And... When Jesus started to have a schedule going to that another place, he didn't want the people to know that Jesus and his disciples were there, according to our text. Maybe because Jesus was actually preparing the disciples after the transfiguration. After the transfiguration, Jesus is preparing himself to face the cross. And time and again, according to our text, Jesus has to remind his disciples three times about his impending death. And each time Jesus Christ talked about his death, the disciples would listen, but they could not understand, or they refused to understand. Why? Because they thought, they followed Jesus for three years. Imagine that Jesus, the disciples followed Jesus for three years. They left their vocation, they left their families in order to follow Jesus. And why is that? Because they believed Jesus Christ was the one. He is the Jesus is the, the Messiah. And according to their understanding, a Messiah is one who liberates the people. Jesus is based on his uh, characteristics, the kind of personality he possesses, his charisma, and the way he teaches, most especially in his ability to heal and, of course, to multiply bread. And so people have thought that he is the one. He is the one to liberate us. From the oppression, from the tyranny of Rome. He's the one to lead the people to an abundant life. And so each time Jesus talked about his death, they listen, they hear him, but they refuse to understand the meaning of that. Because how could he change people's lives if he is dead? How can you change our nation if you're dead? So at this time, they could not actually comprehend. Lucky for us, fortunate for us, every time we talk, and we read this passage that Jesus talked that his life will be offered. All of us today in this modern time can appreciate because it was through the death of Jesus Christ that we were saved. We understand the implication of that. But during the time, the disciples cannot or they refuse to understand it. And while traversing from one place to another after that short seminar, informing them about his death, they were um, walking again to another place. And when they arrive at their destination, Jesus has to ask them, what were you talking about? What were you talking about? And there was no response. There was no... Actually, nobody answered. Were you pay paying attention to our reading? 
when Jesus asked, what were you talking about? None of the disciples actually explained to Jesus because they were silent. Why? Why? And in another passage after this, chapter 10, we have another account of the same topic. But we will look at our text for tonight. And so it was Jesus actually who presented to them the topic. They thought Jesus Christ did not uh, heard what they were talking along the way. And so Jesus presented the, the topic. We're talking about who is the greatest among them. Question, do you aspire to be great? What's in it for you? Why do you want to go to church? Or why do you want to grow in your faith? Why do you want to offer your life to God? What's in it for you? You just want to praise the Lord? What for? Will our praising add to the godness, so to speak, or the divinity of God? Or if we stop praising Him, it will diminish somehow His impact in our lives. Will God become more because of your passion to serve Him? Or God will become less because of your apathy towards your spiritual, uh, spirituality? What's in it for you? Do you aspire to be great in the eyes of God? And you know what? Jesus when nobody speak among them, no, they were silent. Maybe because what? They were embarrassed? What do you think? They were so passionate along the way. They were discussing among themselves, trying to outwit each other. Maybe they were trying to give the best explanation as to who among them is the greatest. Maybe I'm the greatest because... I'm closest to Jesus. Maybe others said, I'm the, uh, the greatest because what one time, I walk on water even if it's a short time. <laughs> you know, that Peter could have, maybe could have said that. Maybe I'm the greatest because why? Because I'm, I'm his closest friend. He allowed me to lean on his uh, shoulder. You know, competition. There's always the competition even among the disciples. And so they were discussing who is the greatest among us. The question is, is Jesus against it? Why the silence? Because sometimes, sometimes, in spite of the things we do that people see in us, like me as a pastor, doing all those things, like ministering to you, praying for the sick, visiting you, and even like the praise and worship, as if they offer themselves totally and wholly before God. But there will be time when we are left on our own and we ask ourselves, am I doing it for the right reason? What will I get out from this? Does God want me to grow? Does God want me to be great in some sense? And the answer to that question is what? Based on what Jesus said, is God, does God want us to be great? And the answer is, huh? The answer is, you're like the disciples also. You're so silent, huh? <laughs> what is the answer? When Jesus asked them, they were silent also. Does God want us to be great? Or Jesus wants us to be great? What do you think? Are you great? Are you great? Do you want to? Again, going back, what's in it for you? Why you keep on coming here? Does God want us to be great? The answer is yes. Yes. But in that silence, God is saying, yes, I want you to be great. However, greatness does not come in being the number one. Greatness happens when you allow yourself to serve. Does God want, it, want me to be great? Of course. You're great. Pastor Pia is great. 
Why? You know, sometimes while we humble ourselves before God because of our sinfulness, but you know what? There are also things you've done that somehow glorifies God. There are things that you have done according to the purpose of God. But most of the time, when we come before God, we humble ourselves. But God does not want us to be diminish the good things we have done to others. Yes, God is for our greatness, so to speak. But He directed us to the way we understand greatness. And there are some things I want to share with us briefly. Greatness is not found in what we have accomplished for ourselves. While we strive to improve, because that is the natural consequence of your intelligence. The function of your brain is to learn. You cannot stop it from learning. And that is why walay taong stupid. Everybody can learn. Because that's how God designed the brain. You can learn. It learns. However, learning per se and bring benefit to yourself is not what makes you great. It is what you have given to others that makes you great. In other words, when you accumulated learnings and wisdom and you have, you have become smarter than anyone else here, ikaw mo pinaka-bright, ikaw pinaka-mayo, good for you. But that is not greatness. The greatness is when you use what you have to help others. The smarter you get, no? the smarter you get, the better you can help those who are struggling in their studies. Correct? Pero dili, pagpakopya. You help them as a tutor or a mentor. Correct? Approve? Yes. Because that, that, that is the natural function of the brain that God has put in our head. Our brain learns. But greatness comes when we share what we have learned to others. Money will come if you are so industrious. If you plan your life well, money will come. Wealth will come. But that is not being great. The greatness in one who has possessed many things is how you share yourself to others. Secondly, greatness never puts itself in a position superior to one another, to other people rather. Your greatness must be in the spirit of servanthood. The more you serve, the more you become great. Always consider your responsibility not only as a test of your abilities, meaning we, we, you, have given, you have been given responsibilities not only to prove what you can do, but to prove the purity of your heart. Everything that you do for God has something to do with your attitude, not so much with your aptitude. Who said that, by the way? The success of your life is not only based on your aptitude, but also in your attitude. I think it was Sig Siglar who said that. The heights of your career is not only dependent on your intelligence, aptitude, but it is also anchored on your attitude. And attitude means not giving up in the midst of trials and persecution. Yes, perseverance, that can be part of it. But more importantly, attitude that is about to caring one another. When Jesus talked about loving others, even if they cannot love us, doing good to those who cannot do good to you, inviting those people who cannot invite you in return, that is greatness. In our spiritual journey, greatness comes to us when we share with others who cannot share with us in return. Greatness comes to us as children of God when we forgive those who has not asked forgiveness nor can change their ways. But still, we forgive. When we forgive, we don't make requirements for them to change. We just forgive because Christ or God commands us to forgive. Your, your forgiveness is not determined or conditioned by the response of the other. Although that is the aspect of justice. No? But forgiveness, according to the Lord's Prayer, we ask for forgiveness the way we forgive 
others. Forgive us our sins as we, as we, and Jesus was right. If you cannot forgive those who sin against you, when you come to God in prayer asking for forgiveness, God will not forgive you your sins. If you can forgive, you're great. If you can share, like the boy who shared his resources that allowed Jesus to feed 5,000 men, and more than that, you're great. When you offer yourself in spite of the limited resources you have, but you know those little things, if you offer it, can do many things, then you understand that's what greatness is all about. Greatness means seeing God in all things you do. Are you great? Can you recall things you have done last week that you can somehow say, of course, Pastor, in my own way, I was able to forgive. In my own little way, I was able to share a portion of what I have. In my own little ways, I have done things that have, in a way, helped other people. Is there anything that you can remember that you have done last week? Any of those things? If you have, you're great. You're great. And keep it that way. The amazing thing about this is this. We like to ask questions so that we can be certain about things we want to be certain about. Okay? I'm repeating myself. However, and we admire people who can actually explain many things to us because that's what we want. In the issue of greatness and meaning of life, however, in Jesus' life, in Jesus Christ's case, he could have explained things beyond the understanding of the, the people of his time. After all, he's God. He knows the secret of the universe. He knows the secret of the beyond. He knows something that even the teachers, the priests, and all great teachers of his time have not understand. And yet, when it comes to life, the question we like to ask about meaning, greatness, doing good things. He used what? A child. Really? <laughs> they were discussing. They were fighting among themselves. They were actually squeezing everything they have learned. Discussing and fighting who is the greatest among. And yet when Jesus spoke, he used a child. Well, it's because Jesus is the one doing it. It must have a meaning. <laughs> have you ever listened to a child? Is there anything amazing about what a child can say to you? Or will say to you? Really? A child? <laughs> and yet Jesus said, greatness comes when you welcome as simple as a little child. Little things. It may be the work you are doing right now that you don't like. Maybe there's greatness in that if you don't give up. In the little things that somehow you compare yourselves with others, they're recognized because they're given this great task. And I am, not, and I am ignored because I'm being assigned to these little things. Jesus Christ used simple things to explain a great question that demands great explanation. Many times in Jesus Christ's journey, he explained the meaning of life by using an illustration that is close to life. Life itself. Learn from your own experience. Learn from the things in the lives of people around you, there you can see the lessons and the answers you are asking and finding to know. What's in it for you? What's in it for you? Do you want to be great in the eyes of God? 
doing those little things that you know can make you exhibit the purity of your heart. Tonight, my friends, may the words of Jesus, may the invitation of Jesus, because simply, Raman, do little things, but do it with the heart of a servant. If you do that, you're great. Brothers and sisters, let's keep it that way as we start this new week. God bless us. Amen.